Hello, my name is John Seablink, and the title of this presentation is The American Revolution Expounded, Historical Context Through Interpersonal Relationships in Assassin's Creed III. Even though video games have been around for quite a while, the idea of studying video games as literature is still a new and controversial idea. English departments around the world are only just now beginning to take them seriously. Very little scholarship has been done on video games, and the little bit of scholarship that has been done usually only focuses on either the technical aspects, the developmental aspects of the games themselves, or on the psychological effects of video games on players, such as video game addiction or the effect that violence has on players. To, so to say that literary analysis and textual analysis of video games is a brand new idea wouldn't be a stretch of the imagination at all. As Joseph Fordham points out in this first quote here, as video games continue to develop and get more and more complex, developers are starting to immerse the games with more and more recreations of history. Real world and historical events are being reproduced at a rapid rate in video games, and this has the potential to change the way everybody including historians, view particular historical events. Dr. Mooring in the second quote um, compares video games with regular literature by saying that they contain both text and context, same way literature such as novels and plays contain text and context. So we can expect that games such as the Assassin's Creed franchise, which I will be talking about today, that are very heavy on history, can contain additional historical context. And I think that there's no better example of this than Ubisoft's Assassin's Creed franchise. The game that I will actually be talking about today is actually the fifth game in the Assassin's Creed series, Assassin's Creed III. It's a rare example of a game set during the Revolutionary War, but also a rare example of a video game that features a Native American protagonist. Players experience Assassin's Creed III through the eyes of Ratona Caton, or Connor as he is called through most of the game. He's actually half Native American, half white. At the beginning of the game, his village is burned to the ground and he is sets off on a mission of revenge, which eventually puts him front and center in some of the most famous events and battles of the American Revolution. Up until the beginning of the game, he has never left his village. He has never experienced life outside of his tribal walls. So this makes him the perfect avatar. His, his naivete makes him the perfect avatar for players to experience the American Revolution and the colonies as he is experiencing everything for the first time himself. Throughout the game, Connor meets, befriends, and forms relationships with a variety of different characters. Through close reading and textual analysis of these relationships, I hope to show that these relationships bring to light and shed light on some of the deeper ideological issues of the Revolutionary War, some of which, one of the first relationships that Connor forms at the beginning of the game is with a black man named Achilles Davenport. Achilles is the leader of the Assassin Brotherhood, which is a secret society that Connor decides to join in order to avenge his people. He teaches Connor and the players controlling Connor about some of the racial issues that were going on in the colonies during this time. He's a parent of what historian John Wood Sweep calls a racial paradox. Achilles is rich. He's got a large homestead in the middle of a giant chunk of land that even people today would be pretty jealous of. He's educated. He knows the ways of the world. He's successful. And yet he is still treated as less than a secondary citizen because of his race. The more successful he is, the more, the more he resembles some of the other rich white colonists in the Boston area, the more his skin color stands out. And that's one of the first lessons that he teaches Connor because when Connor first meets him, his homestead is in disrepair and he does not have the necessary equipment and tools to fix it up, Connor wonders why he doesn't just go into town and buy what he needs, and Connor learns his first lesson of racism from Achilles, that because of his skin color, he is not allowed. It's actually Achilles who gives Connor the name Connor, 
because he tries to pass him off as Spanish or Italian because of his light skin complexion as a way of getting Connor to buy the items he needs to fix up his homestead. And this change of identity causes Connor to suffer something of an identity crisis. As Dr. Dror Vorman of Germany puts it here, underlying long-term pressures that characterize the decades preceding the American crisis and that fed the potential unease about the possibility that identities can be mutable, unreliable, and ultimately unknowable. Kind of demonstrates just how much of an identity crisis the colonies as a whole was having at the time. Many did not know if they could consider themselves to be Americans, if they were British, if they still required loyalty to the crown, if they needed to put their loyalties elsewhere. Connor here is starting to feel the same thing. Is he now an American? Is he now Spanish or Italian because of his skin complexion? Is he still Iroquois? Is he British because the colonies at this time were still under British rule? There's a lot of questions that are arising because of this name change that he goes through, and it really kind of sets him apart from many of the other Iroquois that he knows and has met throughout his life, but it also kind of causes his rebirth as an American colonist. Very early on in their relationship, Achilles introduces Connor to Samuel Adams in Boston. Samuel Adams is a well-known patriot of this area, and he serves as Connor's introduction to some of the political goings-on of the Boston area. In-game, he acts as an instructor to help lower the character's wanted level. If the character causes too much mischief, British soldiers will go after them. And some of the ways that Samuel Adams teaches Connor to get rid of this wanted level is to approach shopkeepers, printers, and town criers and bribe them to get rid of this wanted level for them and to stop printing wanted posters. And with the sheer number of these spread out throughout the colonies that Connor visits, it goes to show just how many people were already up in arms about Britain and were willing to break the law that they saw as unjust in order to stick it to the British. Samuel Adams also introduces Connor to the Sons of Liberty, and this shows that there was already a brewing rebellion that existed long before the first shots of the war were fired at the Battle of Lexicon and Concord. By far the most significant relationship that Connor forms in Assassin's Creed III is with his own father, Haytham Kenway. Haytham is the leader of a rival secret society called the Knights Templar. As Grand Master of the Knights Templar, he is the sworn enemy of the Assassin Brotherhood and puts him to blows with his own son almost from the beginning. Even though both men are well aware of one another, both men know even that their father and son, when they meet, neither one trusts each other. They both try to kill each other, and the only reason they end up working together is because they have a common enemy that they have to destroy. This is representative of just how tense and distrustful the colonies were at the time. Like, the rivalry and the hatred between loyalists and patriots was so intense that even within families, brother against brother, father and son, husband and wife at times, you didn't know who to trust. The distrust and the negative energy that was going on in these colonies was severe, and it's not something that's talked about much in history classes. So. The, the dynamic that Haytham and Connor share, especially at the very beginning when they first meet for the first time, is very, is very telling. Their relationship, unfortunately, doesn't last very long. Eventually, the two men realizes that their ideological differences are so great that it ruins any chance they have of continuing with any kind of relationship, and the two of them are forced in a position where they have to fight one another to the death. Uh, immediately before this confrontation, Connor is seriously injured in an explosion in the sport that he is infiltrating. 
He is seriously wounded. He has what appears to be a concussion. He is barely able to move, and he finds himself up against Hatham, who has arrived at the fold relatively unscathed. And the two men end up fighting a very brutal duel in which Connor does end up being victorious, and his father, Hatham, ends up dying, but it costs Connor a great deal of strength to the point where he almost dies himself. And this is an analogy of the entire American Revolution as a whole. Because on one side, you had the Continental Army, which was made up of untested, poorly equipped, severely drained and injured colonials fighting against British regulars who were experienced, well-equipped, better trained, battle-hardened, and a force to be reckoned with. And the fact that Haytham, like the British, ended up losing to this in a battle in which the odds were definitely in his favor, just goes to show just how strong the morals and ideas of the colonists represented here by Connor were, and it propelled them to victory even against the harshest of odds. The last of Connor's relationships that I want to talk about today is probably the most tragic of the bunch. This is with his childhood friend, Kanan Tokon. Both boys grew up together. They hunted, fished, and did various chores together for their tribe. Even after he joined the Assassin Brotherhood, Connor would be approached by Connor Tokon, who would travel to the Davenport homestead in order to enlist Connor's help in protecting the tribe from various threats. But as the American Revolution progressed and hostilities between Native Americans and the colonists intensified, Conan Tolkien is manipulated by the Knights Templar into siding with the British while Connor remains allied with the colonials. And this unfortunately leads to a confrontation where the two men are forced to battle one another and Connor has to take his friend's life. Around the same time period in the real world, the Iroquois Confederacy or the Six Nations were which had existed for hundreds and hundreds of years, was also being forced by the British and the colonials to take sides, and it ended up splitting this great Native American nation into multiple different factions. And this dynamic between Conan Tolkien and Connor really signifies the great changes that had to take place in the world of the Native Americans as the British and Americans fought each other. This is a topic of the American Revolution that has not been studied much by historians. There are very few books, very few scholarly articles that talk about the role that Native Americans played in the American Revolution and the fact that Ubisoft decided to include this in Assassin's Creed 3, I think is pretty remarkable and definitely worth deeper analysis in the future. By analyzing these four of many relationships that Connor Kenway forms with people throughout Assassin's Creed 3, I hope it brings to light some of the deeper historical contents that is buried within the dialogue and gameplay in the game. I hope that my use of textual analysis and literary analysis on the game itself shows that it warrants being studied as a branch of literature in literary studies. I also hope to show how useful and insightful it can be in the classroom, teaching history and literature and expounding on some topics that otherwise do not get touched upon at all. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.